with yet another unit, Societies at Crossroads, uh, which is exactly the same title as the textbook chapter. I'm not very creative in my titling of things in this class. Uh, here in this chapter and in this uh, PowerPoint lecture, we'll look at four uh, countries uh, during the late, uh, say, mid 19th century to late 19th and early 20th centuries, uh, three, uh, four countries that were uh, uh, in s similar situations uh, uh, to some degree. First, we'll take a look at the Ottoman Empire, which was more of an empire, of course, than a single country, centered in Turkey, however. Then we'll look at the difficulties uh, and the challenges facing the Russian Empire, followed by the same with regard to the Chinese Empire, uh, and uh, ending with a look at uh, actually revolutionary changes uh, in Japan uh, at roughly the same time. Bentley tells us uh, that reformers in all four societies, the four I just mentioned, promoted plans to introduce written constitutions, limit the authority of rulers, make governments responsive to the needs and desires of the people, and begin processes of industrialization. Uh, meaning moving towards modern economies and industrial revolutions. Uh, and it turned out differently in all four places, uh, and we'll at least explore some of that as we go along. So the Ottoman Empire first. By the early 19th century, Europeans were only already calling, calling the Ottoman Empire the sick man of Europe. Remember, this, the Ottoman Empire was the uh, Islamic empire that dominated the Islamic world at the time, uh, and it had been a very, very powerful uh, military uh, opponent to anybody who faced it uh, for centuries. The Ottomans, uh, for instance, in 1453, as we might remember, uh, captured Constantinople, uh, and uh, which was the final uh, nail in the coffin of the Byzantine Empire. Uh, but by the early 19th century, the Ottoman Empire was in decline economically, militarily, and otherwise. Bentley saying, by the early 19th century, the Ottoman state could no longer ward off European economic penetration or prevent territorial dismemberment. The once powerful realm slipped into decline, its sovereignty maintained largely by the same European powers that exploited its economy. So, and by the time we sort of get back to the Ottoman state, uh, their glory days uh, have gone, uh, and uh, the empire's barely holding on. Uh, the Europeans are having to loan them lots of money, as we'll see. Uh, so they're, the Ottoman Empire's in, in debt, and in debt to the people you don't want to be in debt to, the Europeans, uh, because they have the power uh, to make life difficult for you if you can't pay back your debts. Territorial dismemberment. Uh, meant that uh, they were the Ottoman Empire was losing territory, uh, one country or empire after another, uh, or peop, uh, certain groups rising up uh, in rebellion against the Ottoman Empire. Either way, uh, a territory was uh, being taken away from them internally uh, and externally. Uh, the last phrase in the quote, the same European powers that exploited its economy uh, and sovereignty maintained largely by such powers uh, meant that the Ottoman Empire may have uh, collapsed before the early 20th century when it finally did collapse, just at the end of World War One, partly because of the end of World War One or World War I itself. Uh, but the European powers kind of in agreed somewhat informally uh, that uh, it would be better off for all of them to kind of contribute to keeping the Ottoman Empire alive, uh, at least until they could figure out what to do with it, not because they cared about the Ottoman Empire or the Muslim world, they didn't, but because uh, they knew that competition between the European powers themselves, Russia, you know, Great Britain, France, etc., uh, uh, could uh, cause major problems between those countries, the European countries, that could lead to uh, you know, a very large and destructive war or wars. And the cartoon you see there uh, is uh, the European powers doing exactly that, competing with each other for territory uh, uh, carved out of the once mighty Ottoman Empire. Uh, and, and that eventually did start to happen uh, uh, around the beginning of the 20th century or just into the 20th century. Uh, but uh, throughout the 19th century, the European powers uh, 
did kind of agree to work together to help prop up the Ottoman state uh, uh, for the reasons just mentioned. So the empire was in military uh, decline as well as territorial loss, and I'm not going to go into it, but you can and probably should look at the map to get uh, some indication uh, of where and when and how much territory was lost. The core of the empire was Turkey, uh, what you see kind of in the gold center region there. But all of the outlying regions in different colors uh, were lost at one time or another to one country, uh, people uh, or another. Uh, remember that from an earlier unit, we learned that the heart uh, or the key to Ottoman military power were the Janissaries. Janissaries were uh, children that were kidnapped from uh, southeastern Europe, which you see on the, the upper left of the map in earlier wars, who were then uh, brought back to uh, the capital and uh, trained to be the primary fighting force uh, of the Ottoman Empire. The idea is if we take these people kind of from outside, but bring them up you know, their entire lives, instilling Ottoman values and teaching them Ottoman fighting skills and discipline, uh, then they'll be totally loyal to us and they'll be there's no one else for them to be loyal to loyal to because their families are hundreds of miles away and they're not going to ever uh, get get to see them it, as cruel as it may have been to the children which of course it was uh, from a strategic perspective uh, it was actually a pretty brilliant uh, idea uh, and a rather unique one uh, as far as what we've seen uh, in terms of military forces and structures in other uh, empires uh, in this very class. So Peter Mansfield, uh, in the history of the Middle East, says the Janissaries were not only a superb fighting force in the campaigns against the Sultan's enemies, the Sultan was the head, the king of the Ottoman Empire, they also maintained the internal security of the entire empire, uh, meaning they put down rebellions, uh, or you know, tried to keep them from happening at all. It was probably inevitable that they, the Janissaries, should in time become not only an autonomous power, but also one that was fiercely opposed to any change in the system. Uh, as the clear Ottoman superiority in military skills over the empire's enemies declined, the Janissaries rejected all attempts to reform the army along the new lines that had been developed in the West. So, certain leaders and certain sultans uh, started to realize uh, we are not able to compete with the European countries in a way that we once were, mainly because they're getting way ahead of us in military technology uh, and actually in military tactics and strategy as well. Uh, but the Janissaries were such an old uh, sort of entrenched part of the bureaucracy by now uh, that they had power in their own rights. Uh, and so you couldn't just uh, just tell them what to do. Uh, um, this tends to happen with bureaucracies uh, in any government. Uh, if they're entrenched, have been there for a long time, they become kind of a power unto themselves, even if they were originally supposed to, you know, answer at, to, you know, at and to the back and call of a government or to a, a leader. So uh, it's not the only reason for the decline militarily and then the territorial loss because of that, uh, but it might be the most important reason. Along comes Muhammad Ali, uh, not the boxer, uh, uh, but uh, the uh, ruler of Egypt uh, for quite some time in, in the middle of the uh, beginning to middle of the 19th century. And technically, uh, Muhammad Ali uh, was supposed to be a subject of the Ottoman Sultan. Egypt was part of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, but the very fact that we're talking about him at, at all, sort of separately from uh, the Ottoman sultans and the Ottoman Empire shows us some of the weaknesses uh, of the Ottoman state. Uh, and that is that Ali, most famously, but uh, in a few other cases as well, uh, uh, more or less carved out autonomy uh, for his uh, part of the empire, Egypt, uh, basically meaning that it was self-governing. It was still technically, uh, and by the letter of the law, part of the Ottoman Empire, uh, but uh, Egypt pretty much went it, its own way uh, from this point. Uh, and a lot of it was due to the talent uh, and great ability of this gentleman here, uh, Ali, uh, uh, who had a huge effect, uh, uh, impact on Egypt, uh, as uh, said by Bernard Lewis, one of the great experts on Middle Eastern history, uh, 
uh, in uh, one of his books, the famous Muhammad Ali Pasha, governor uh, of Egypt from 1805 to 1848, conducted a diplomatic and even military struggle against the Ottoman Sultan and was prevented only by the intervention of the European powers from utterly defeating him. So he actually at one time was on the verge of militarily defeating uh, basically his boss, uh, the, the Ottoman Sultan. Uh, he was, however, able to make Egypt an autonomous and hereditary principality, which means he could hand down uh, the governorship to, uh, of Egypt to his you know, uh, forebears or to his uh, uh, children, progeny, uh, and to launch it on the way to modernization. So uh, Ali uh, at least uh, took that part of the Ottoman Empire under his own you know, uh, tutelage uh, and worked uh, to find ways to uh, industrialize. He was, I think, uh, fighting an uphill battle because uh, the Europeans were increasingly powerful uh, in this part of the world uh, and because uh, the geography and climate uh, didn't, uh, didn't benefit him the way the geography and climate benefited Europe and other parts of the world. Uh, but uh, uh, he tried to ramp up industrial production, agricultural production, uh, get uh, Egypt connected uh, more into world trade markets, etc., with some success. Uh, but uh, in the end, I, I don't think it's safe to say that it succeeded in the long run, but probably through no fault of uh, Muhammad Ali's. So the Ottoman Empire, not just uh, Egypt itself, uh, but uh, uh, as a whole, uh, began to be over, become over reliant on the Europeans, and they didn't want to be reliant on them at all. But they sort of felt they had no choice. Uh, as the Ottoman economy uh, uh, languished for reasons we don't have time to really get into, uh, it became uh, apparent that the 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 financial situation might cause the you know the, the government to go bankrupt. So as Bentley uh, writes, gradually the Ottoman Empire moved toward fiscal insolvency and financial dependency. After the middle of the 19th century, economic development in the Ottoman Empire depended heavily on foreign loans as European capital financed the construction of railroads, utilities, uh, and mining enterprises. Interest payments grew to the point that they consumed more than half of the empire's revenues. Uh, half of their tax dollars coming in every year uh, went to paying off just the interest on the debt they owed to the European countries, mainly to Britain and France. In 1882, the Ottoman state was unable to pay interest on its loans and had no choice but to accept foreign administration of its debts, uh, which again man ma meant mainly the British and French got to come in and uh, kind of be the bookkeepers for them, uh, the, with them having really no choice. Uh, and the that Europeans didn't come in and say, hey, you know, we're just here to kind of watch and uh, uh, advise you. They came in and said, get out of our way. Uh, we're, we're taking over your finances here because you owe us a lot of money. Uh, and this caused uh, all kinds of problems and is yet another clear sign uh, that the Ottoman Empire uh, is uh, was, probably, uh, was probably accurate to call it the sick man of Europe. Uh, the empire was indeed uh, ill uh, and possibly had a, you know, a fatal... Uh, 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 illness, at least in the future. The reforms of Mahmud II, uh, he comes along uh, after uh, uh, Muhammad Ali. And again, this guy's the Ottoman Sultan, not just the governor of Egypt. Uh, so technically, anyway, he's a bigger deal uh, and was a pretty, a pretty uh, smooth operator politically, politically savvy, as Bentley tells us here. Uh, and ensured that his reforms, and that's what he's most known for, uh, uh, the reforms of Mahmud II, uh, they were perceived, uh, he ensured that his reforms were perceived not as a dangerous uh, infidel uh, making innovations, but rather as a restoration of the traditional Ottoman military. Uh, so because of the traditions uh, and uh, traditional uh, Islamic uh, you know, religious culture, uh, he had to uh, be careful about the way he framed his reforms uh, to make them look like they were in keeping with traditions in the past, even though in many ways they were moving away from the past. When the Janissaries mutinied in protest, uh, uh, Mahmud had them massacred by troops loyal to the Sultan, uh, which cleared the way for a series of reforms that unfolded during the last 13 years of his reign. Uh, 
Uh, so we saw that the Janissaries had a lot of power uh, just up until this moment, really. Uh, but Mahmoud II uh, was quite determined and, again, quite politically adept uh, and ap apparently militarily as well. And he found troops that went you know, around the Janissaries and eventually engaged them in combat and defeated them. So the Janissaries went from being uh, ultra-powerful for a number of centuries to being gone, uh, eliminated by 1826. After uh, Mahmoud uh, comes the Tanzimat reforms uh, in the years that you see on the screen here, so over a number of decades. Uh, this uh, then was during the reigns of a number of sultans in a row, but it was increasingly perceived correctly, I think as it turned out, uh, that uh, for the Ottoman Empire to keep up, maybe even to survive, it needed to westernize. It was going to have to you know, do some of the things that it saw the European powers doing, which is what made them powers in the first place, or they were going to uh, uh, languish or go under. So Western education was introduced. Uh, this uh, caused uh, all kinds of uh, uh, turmoil uh, or polarization uh, in traditional circles because there were plenty of uh, uh, people and groups uh, in the uh, Ottoman world uh, that, uh, again, wanted to maintain tradition and not westernize or Europeanize in any way. University education was reorganized, uh, postal and telegraph systems introduced, newspapers were established, uh, legal reforms were mandated, uh, a new constitution uh, was written, uh, kind of modeled on, again, Western European lines, uh, etc. Uh, modern communication systems, and that had been somewhat true uh, in the reforms uh, of even, sorry to go back, I'm dizzy here. Uh, but Muhammad Ali uh, himself uh, and uh, Mahmoud II uh, as well, uh, right? Uh, centralized control of the empire, uh, built modern schools or created modern schools, secondary uh, high school uh, type system, new roads, telegraph lines, postal service. So this had been in the making for a time. Uh, this uh, Tanzimat series of reforms is are kind of the next steps. But as Peter Mansfield says, Conservative opposition was powerful because the reforms were revolutionary in purpose and content. Although their achievements fell well short of their intentions, they initiated notable changes in the way the empire was governed and administered uh, uh, you know, were in some ways successful. Uh, so uh, they did initiate, uh, again, notable changes. Did it uh, allow the empire to survive? Well, for a number of years, uh, since the empire did collapse uh, about 40 years uh, after these reforms were finally fully put in place, it's hard to say uh, if there was an extended life uh, for, and health of the empire because of these reforms, or if the reformers might have helped to kill off the empire. Uh, it's hard to know. It does look like these were moving in, in the right direction. Uh, I don't mean right morally, but right as correct if it, the empire wanted to survive uh, and uh, be healthy over the long term. Uh, but maybe too little too late. Maybe there were too many other pressures, uh, uh, other factors, you know, working against the Ottoman Empire so that these reforms weren't uh, enough, uh, even if they were totally successful, and they weren't totally successful. Then comes the Young Turk movement and era uh, between 1908 and 1918, uh, so just into the 20th century. The Young Turks uh, were a group of uh, army officers, uh, primarily at first, many of them young, hence Young Turk, get it? Uh, so uh, these were young guys from Turkey. <laughs> uh, and the movement, uh, as uh, Mansfield says, uh, spread rapidly among the students in the military, medical and law colleges in the capital and in the provinces. The Young Turks, led by Major Enver Bey, you can see sort of in the upper left of the postage stamp there, uh, uh, again, an army officer, demanded the restoration of constitutional rule. There had been a constitution uh, introduced by an earlier sultan, but it had been kind of put, uh, it had been tabled. Uh, but the young Turks successfully pressured uh, the uh, current uh, present sultan into uh, bringing it back uh, in, you know, into existence. Uh, the group then successfully pushed the sultan, oh, I already said that part. Uh, Inverbay Inver proclaimed uh, 
the end of arbitrary governments and the principles of the new order, uh, saying, henceforth, we are all brothers. Under the same blue sky, we are all equal. We glory in being Ottomans. So they frame this as you know, them, the Young Turks, being kind of the most patriotic uh, group. Uh, you can think of them as kind of a political party uh, in the Ottoman Empire. And in the end, uh, it became increasingly clear that they were uh, you know, bent on taking power themselves, uh, which we're not going to get to here, but in a later chapter we will. Uh, this gets us to the career, or will get us to the career of uh, Mustafa Kemal or Ataturk. Uh, the first uh, leader uh, of an independent Turkey after the fall of the Ottoman Empire on the far side of the uh, First World War. We now get to uh, developments in Russia uh, and look at the Russian Empire under pressure. The picture you see there uh, is uh, depicting the assassination of Tsar Alexander II in 1881 by uh, revolutionaries uh, who were by that time already uh, assassinating leaders all over the place uh, wanting to overthrow, excuse me, Tsarist rule uh, and Romanov rule, the same family, the Romanovs had ruled Russia for about 300 years by this time. Uh, and they ruled with an iron fist, uh, an authoritarian state, uh, which in terms of basic political freedoms and Democratic institutions uh, was far behind any other uh, in Europe or uh, in that part of the world. Uh, so no wonder uh, there was revolutionary activity, and it only grew more and more with time. Uh, Professor Bentley uh, says, The Russian Empire experienced battlefield reverses that laid bare the economic and technological disparity between Russia and Western Europe, uh, European powers. The keystone of these efforts was the emancipation of the serfs, which we'll get to. Social, rep social reform like that paved the way for government-sponsored industrialization, an industrial revolution, uh, which began to transform Russian society during the last decades of the 19th century. Remember, on the opening slide, I said all four of these uh, political entities that we're looking at uh, in this unit uh, are all trying to, uh, you know, uh, to one degree or another, industrialize. The stage was set for a debacle, as one historian has said. Russian defeat in the Crimean War. Did you even know there was a Crimean War? <laughs> there was. Actually, there's still war in the Crimea these days, but this was the, the Crimean War between 1853 and 1856. It's not one of your more famous wars. Uh, I don't think American uh, students usually learn about this war very much. I say that somewhat jokingly, but uh, it is true. We don't really learn much right about it. Uh, and... Uh, it pitted, uh, uh, at least as the major uh, powers fighting, Britain and France against Russia. Uh, and Britain and France uh, had been used to being enemies of each other most of the time. Uh, not all the time, but most of the time, uh, for hundreds of years. So, and, and they were allies again after this in the First World War, the Second World War. They're basically allies now. Uh, but this was something new at the time. And it leads me to a great story. Uh, one of my professors told me this story uh, in class uh, one time uh, when I was a college student. I know it's hard to believe, but I once was a college student. And I, went, I once was young. I know it's impossible to even picture, uh, but uh, I was. Uh, and the story was, uh, this is true. Uh, there was an old British general uh, who uh, was you know, sort of one of the military planners for the British campaign in this war, and they, since they were allies with the French, they did some planning and you know a strategy. You know, staff officers in both the British and French armies in the same room, you know, pouring over maps and looking at, talking about where to move troops and what's going on, uh, and trying to plan strategy together. Uh, and the 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 old, I guess, semi senile. Uh, uh, British guy uh, kept sort of saying, "Yeah, and if we go here, we can uh, we can beat the French. I mean, I mean the Russians. Uh, and if we do that, we can take the French by surprise. I mean the the Russians, but because he was so used to uh, fighting the French uh, in the past throughout his career, uh, he kept just saying, uh, 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 we're fighting France uh, uh, with other French allies in the room. So it was kind of an uncomfortable moment uh, for everybody else uh, in the room. Uh, so that's 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 the good story.' 
not so good. Uh, I, I loved it in, in my own day. Maybe, maybe I massacred the way I told it. Uh, so, uh, Russia, uh, as Bantley again uh, uh, fills us in, was a respected and feared military power uh, and maintained its tradition of conquest and expansion. Uh, one of the reasons it was respected and feared, not the only one, but one of them uh, is simple. Russia was big and it had a huge army. Uh, so uh, this alone intimidated uh, many other uh, uh, kingdoms and states, uh, uh, even its uh, European uh, foes and sometimes allies, depending on which war we're looking at. After defeating Turkish Turkish forces, technically, again, part of the Ottoman Empire, in a war from 1828 uh, to 1829, Russia tried to establish a protectorate over the weakening Ottoman Empire, which mean a protectorate means uh, we're going to become kind of like their uh, wards. Uh, uh, this is going to be kind of like a, a conservatorship over the, uh, you know, over the Ottoman Empire. Uh, Russia is going to, uh, you know, conserve the Ottoman Empire, which is a, a nice way of saying we're basically taking over. Uh, and it ends up being less than taking over. But to a foreign country concerned about Russia's power growing too large, like Britain uh, and or France, uh, they're going to see that as a power grab, and it, to some degree it was. Uh, so not surprisingly, uh, this brought uh, military conflict between Russia and the coalition, including Britain, France, and the Ottoman Empire. Uh, the Crimean War uh, uh, clearly, I'm skipping ahead here uh, in the book, clearly revealed the weakness of the Russian Empire against the industrial powers of Western Europe. The The Militaries on all sides fumbled and bumbled and bumbled and fumbled the way through this war. Just mistake after mistake after mistake. They got a lot of people killed unnecessarily. All sides uh, uh, had this problem. But uh, it was very clear, uh, and Russia did lose the war, uh, that uh, they lost the war uh, uh, in large part because uh, compared to Britain and France, Russia was backward indeed, economically, technologically, scientifically, militarily, uh, and on and on. Uh, and so this has to be understood, the debacle uh, of the Crimean War, uh, as sort of the uh, major springboard uh, to political, economic, uh, and other reforms that come after it in Russia, in the era we're talking about. So sure enough, uh, Alexander II, Tsar uh, uh, in the middle uh, of the 19th century uh, uh, was the one who first initiated sort of major modernizing reforms on the other side uh, of the uh, Crimean War. Uh, actually, he had become czar uh, just after, uh, on the tail end uh, of the war, uh, uh, replacing his uh, father. Uh, he emancipated the serfs, most famously in 1861. Uh, peasants, uh, uh, up until that late date, uh, had not all, but most, uh, basically were owned uh, by wealthy landlords, the gentry or nobility in Russia. There had been uh, serfs and serfdom in Western Europe, but uh, in the Western European countries, it had ended decades before this. So another uh, example of Russia uh, being behind the European countries. And Alexander II didn't undertake this reform uh, freeing the serfs, uh, you know, allowing them to become you know, free citizens. Serfdom was much like slavery, maybe not as bad, uh, lacking a racial or racist element to it, because these are all Russians, but nonetheless, uh, uh, it was uh, something akin to slavery. So this is a modernizing and even uh, democratizing reform, uh, certainly uh, you know, uh, in the direction of liberty. Uh, but... Alexander II clearly wasn't doing it out of you know great concern, humanitarian uh, instincts and impulses. He may have had them, uh, uh, but uh, he was doing this uh, as a way to strengthen Russia, uh, again, with the Crimean War fresh in his mind. Uh, but whatever his motives, the you know, this is an important reform, uh, and the most important one, the money he's most remembered for, but it sort of just started the ball rolling to other modernizing reforms, uh, some of which we'll look at. Uh, the moral value of the emancipation, meaning freeing of the serfs, was no doubt tremendous, if incalculable, uh, according to Nicholas Ryasinovsky uh, in his uh, masterful History of Russia uh, in two volumes. Uh, 
Uh, he goes on to write, together with their liberty, serfs who had been engaged in farming received land. Uh, former serfs were to reimburse the state over a period of 49 years. So you got land that the government basically uh, agreed to pay off the nobles and the gentry, the former landowner who used to have to pay rent to uh, and couldn't leave couldn't leave the land uh, unless they allowed you to uh, or said you could you know leave for a while, which they usually didn't. Uh, so this the only way that the czar could make this happen, and he knew it ahead of time, uh, was to find a way to pay back the landlords who were going to be losing all this labor. Uh, and since the peasants didn't have the money, for the most part, uh, to pay the, land, the, the landlords, their former bosses, nobles, uh, then uh, the government uh, sort of basically uh, was the banker here, or the middleman uh, making this deal happen. Uh, and they, in, th they paid off the nobility immediately, uh, and then collected from the peasants, uh, you know, like a mortgage uh, payment, uh, uh, you know, every month, every year, uh, until peasants could pay it off, and some could, some couldn't uh, uh, do it. Uh, so it it wasn't necessarily uh, a great arrangement. It didn't make uh, life, uh, you know, sort of sunny and carefree for most peasants, uh, but it clearly was a step up from being a virtual slave. Uh, the great reforms, uh, meaning the whole package of reforms that follow on the heels of this first uh, you know, gigantic one, had come only after the Crimean War had demonstrated the total bankruptcy of the old system, and they owed little to any far-reaching, uh, uh, any or little to any far-reaching liberalism or vision on the part of Alexander II and his immediate associates. So really already said that, uh, but uh, so he was no liberal per se. He's responding to what he believes are practical concerns for Russia as a whole. That doesn't mean he had no concern for the average you know, person and peasant farmer in Russia, but that he's thinking about Russian power, uh, the Russian economy, the Russian military, uh, etc. And of course, that was part of his job, uh, that you can't keep the people happy uh, or safe if you can't keep your borders from you know, uh, being invaded by somebody else. Other reforms that came in the wake of the emancipation of the serfs uh, was uh, sort of an overhaul of the uh, local uh, political structure in Russia, the zemstvos, as they were known, which existed, uh, uh, pre-existed this time period, uh, but they were reformed and changed, modernized to some degree. Uh, Ryazanovsky, again, telling us that for centuries, local government had remained a particularly weak aspect of Russian administration and life. In spite of its deficiencies, the Zemstvo system, meaning the new one, the reform Zemstvo system, accomplished much for rural Russia from its establishment in 1864, uh, just after the emancipation of the serfs, until its demise in 1917. Especially valuable were its contributions to public education uh, and health. So uh, this uh, was a way to sort of inject energy uh, and innovation uh, into the system uh, at sort of the local level and not make everything top down, which I believe was an incredibly good idea. Uh, again, how much it worked uh, and didn't work is complicated because, you know, there are other factors helping uh, to explain, uh, you know, what happened in Russia uh, over the following decades. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the, in theory, anyway, uh, this, I believe, was a good idea, uh, whether it worked out in practice or how well it was structured uh, is also, uh, uh, you know, uh, open to question also. The beginnings of industrialization are usually seen to have begun uh, somewhat in the hands of, of this gentleman, uh, Count Sergei Vita, uh, one of the most famous figures in Russian history. Uh, Count means that he was a nobleman, came from a distinguished, wealthy family. Uh, and uh, most distinguished noble families in Europe, uh, as in other parts of the world, uh, in some cases, uh, weren't the, the type that you usually expect to be at the head of uh, industrialization or an industrial revolution. Uh, remember, we saw this in other parts of Europe, that the nobles often see the capitalists uh, as uh, uh, not only competitors, but they see them as inferior competitors, uh, as kind of dirtbags, noblemen. Uh, often uh, throughout history have stuck their noses up in the air and said, Ugh, those capitalists, you know, they made their money by working for it? 
That's disgusting, uh, uh, right? Uh, but Vita uh, was an exception to the rule, uh, big time, uh, because uh, uh, as a high government official, uh, his job was to do what was best for Russia, uh, best for its power vis-a-vis -vis, uh, other countries in the world, among other uh, you know parts of his job. Uh, and he recognized, uh, rightly, uh, that Russia needed uh, to make these uh, reforms in the direction of an industrial revolution, or they were going to go under, or, or at least languish, vis-a-vis uh, -vis other uh, countries and powers. Uh, Ria Sanofsky, uh, quoting yet again, says, if the great reform, right, all of these uh, reforms under uh, Alexander II, helped push the gentry down a steep incline, they also led to the rise of a Russian middle class, and in particular of industrialists, businessmen, and technicians. Russian industry continued to grow, and in the 1890s shot up at an amazing rate. The Ministry of Finance, under Vita, in addition to building railroads and trying to attract capital from abroad, mainly other European countries, did everything possible to develop heavy industry in Russia. Uh, he's probably most famous for overseeing the construction of something known as the Trans-Siberian Railroad, uh, which took a number of decades to complete, uh, which went uh, across a gigantic stretch uh, of Asia, uh, basically connecting Russia uh, with the Pacific uh, and China. Uh, but uh, he was also involved in many, many other projects uh, that uh, kind of fall under the category, as you see on the slide there, of state-sponsored industrialization. Uh, and it, it did lead to, lead to a lot of discontent, uh, again, because Vita saw his job not as looking out for the interests of individual you know, peasant farmers, uh, but as looking out for the interests of Russia as a whole. And again, that was his job, but uh, the plight of poor average people can kind of fall uh, by the wayside, uh, uh, when uh, somebody has their eye on sort of the bigger picture, uh, and surely that's the way uh, peasant farmers, poor people in Russia in gen uh, general saw this, uh, because even though these reforms were at least in part uh, uh, supposed to help the average person, uh, even if that wasn't the primary goal, it was still supposed to help them, uh, there was increasing unrest uh, in the country, big time, uh, and it would only get worse and worse and worse. So industrial discontent, uh, workers uh, not happy uh, with the conditions uh, in the early Industrial Revolution, peasant farmers not happy with their lot even after the emancipation of the serfs. Uh, the czars of Russia uh, you know, uh, placed all kinds of uh, repression, uh, put repression uh, as sort of the rule, oppression, uh, uh, you know, uh, to try to put down revolutionary groups and rebellious uh, uh, movements, and there were a growing number of them. So the rise of revolutionary parties. In the upper left is a picture of the Bolshevik uh, leader Lenin, uh, who we'll get to in a later unit because he's the key uh, Russian revolutionary, at least he came to be. Uh, it wasn't clear in the late 19th, early 20th centuries uh, that he and his party were going to be the ones that uh, successfully carried out a revolution in Russia. Uh, but we know that that's uh, uh, what ended up happening. But at the time, you see him sort of you know, drawn in this painting here. Uh, he was the leader of one of many revolutionary parties uh, in Russia, uh, a growing number of whom uh, were uh, Marxist in orientation, uh, influenced by the works of uh, the greatest socialist uh, intellectual ever, uh, Karl Marx. So uh, Marxist, Marxism is a brand, uh, a rather fervent brand of socialism. Uh, Bentley tells us that uh, peasant rebellions and strikes by industrial workers indicated that large segments of the population were unwilling to tolerate the low standard of living that Vita's policy entailed. Uh, peasants seethed with discontent because they had little uh, uh, or no land. Increasingly, mobile dissidents spread rebellious ideas between industrial cities. At the center of the opposition were university students and a class of intellectuals, collectively known as the intelligentsia. Uh, so uh, there was growing unrest, uh, particularly among uh, you know, intellectuals who were often the leaders uh, of one or another uh, revolutionary party. And by the way, it was, of course, illegal and dangerous to be part of a revolutionary party, uh, some of which were already by the 1870s, 1880s, 
decades before the revolution, uh, uh, you know, actually did topple the czars and the Romanov dynasty under the leadership of Lenin, who you see right here, they were already assassinating uh, leaders all the time. In fact, our opening slide in this entire lecture, or in this section of the lecture, uh, showed a bomb exploding uh, and killing Alexander II, the guy that just pushed through all the, the great reforms. Uh, in 1881, he was assassinated uh, by one of the revolutionary groups, succeeded by uh, uh, his son, Alexander III, uh, who was notorious throughout the rest of his career and you know, a czar uh, for being a staunch conservative, reactionary. Uh, and uh, it probably had something to do uh, with, uh, you know, not necessarily witnessing, but, you know, being uh, alive and sort of having to hear that his father had just been assassinated uh, by radicals. Uh, so uh, Russia uh, was starting to industrialize, uh, but not without... Uh, a great deal of pushback uh, from the population. Now, had it been done a different way, uh, is it possible there would have been less pushback? Possibly. Uh, but it probably, the, the discontent probably had to do with the combination of all of the wrenching changes that industrialization bring around because Vita's policies, again, were designed to get the economy as a whole going uh, and you know, to do that, he did things like try to balance the budget, uh, and balance the budget means sort of then uh, not necessarily you know having government uh, available uh, for sort of needs. There wasn't a welfare state yet anywhere in those days. Uh, well, there were in a few places, but not, certainly in Russia, uh, not even in the U.S. yet. Uh, but uh, his policies uh, weren't exactly designed in the short run. Uh, to take care of the basic needs and necessities of the working class and poor peasantry. Uh, but that, uh, you know, the problems and difficulties for average workers in the early phases of this Industrial Revolution combined uh, with the long-term suffering of the same poor, you know, peasants and workers uh, at the hands of the most repressive dynasty uh, or monarchy in Europe, the Romanov dynasty, under the czars, uh, those two things combined, uh, I think, uh, explain uh, the revolutionary discontent that's just off the charts. There's nothing like this in France uh, or uh, in England by this time. Now, there was, we know, in the 18th century in France, uh, but uh, and there have been other revolutions since then uh, in Europe, but uh, nothing like this kind of uh, uh, absolutely, uh, in some ways, fanatical, uh, depending on the party, uh, opposition uh, to the to the czars, which brings us to Nicholas II, the last Romanov czar, the last czar of Russia. Period, uh, in the revolution of 1905. Uh, so there's actually another Russian revolution. This one, uh, less well known, because this one didn't again uh, uh, end the czarist regime, uh, but it was sort of a step on the road to it although nobody could have known that for sure at the time. It's the revolution of 1917 that we'll talk about in a later unit, uh, the one that Lenin uh, is involved in. Uh, that's what's usually considered to be the Russian revolution. Nonetheless, uh, this was an important, again, stage uh, in the process. Uh, it happened when it did, uh, partly because Russia was involved in a disastrous war, uh, and uh, once again on the losing uh, end, of a disastrous war against Japan, uh, another one of our subjects uh, later in this lecture. Uh, and Japan was a newly industrialized uh, country and it just kind of entered the top tier of world powers uh, and showed that it belonged by defeating first China in a war and then uh, in less than 10 years defeating Russia in a war. Uh, and uh, uh, Trust me, that caused the rest of Europe and the rest of the world to sit up and take notice of Japan. Uh-oh, uh, uh, these guys seemingly came out of seemingly came out of nowhere, but we're going to have to, uh, you know, respect them now because they just defeated Russia in a war. Now they didn't conquer Russia; uh, they didn't even come close. They didn't even try, but they won the war overwhelmingly, both on land, with regard to land and sea battles. It was just a blowout victory in favor of Japan, uh, and this. Uh, helped kind of drive discontent uh, and uh, had the czar and his governments, uh, you know, preoccupied uh, looking at other places. Uh, and the, the war uh, also was a factor in difficult economic conditions, particularly for workers in cities 
uh, you know, prices and uh, shortages of this and, you know, malnutrition. Uh, uh, the war didn't last that long, but it contributed to some of these problems. Uh, and so uh, with all of the pressures that they've been building, a few of which we've talked about, some of which we didn't, uh, on a winter's day uh, at a place called the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg, capital of the time, uh, which is now known as Bloody Sunday, uh, there were protesters, uh, thousands and thousands of them that surrounded the Winter Palaces, one of the Tsar's mini palaces, in this case, Nicholas II, uh, and uh, troops were sent out to try to disperse the crowd uh, who opened fire on the protesters, killing 130 of them, uh, and I forget, wounding you know far more than that. Uh, this is the day now known as Bloody Sunday, uh, and so it so has an infamous uh, uh, you know uh, history to it. There, are, by the way, by the way, other Bloody Sundays uh, in other countries' histories. Sometimes when they somebody coins a phrase like this, it gets sort of uh, you know used over and over again. So there's a bloody Bloody Sunday in Irish history, for instance. Uh, and a few other places. Uh, Bentley uh, reveals to us that the revolutionary turmoil paralyzed Russian cities and forced the government to make concessions. Sergei Vita uh, urged the Tsar to create an elected legislative assembly. The Tsar reluctantly consented and permitted the establishment of the Duma, as it was known, Russia's first parliamentary institution. Uh, so uh, the Tsar didn't want to do it, uh, Vita, as always, uh, was a nobleman uh, thinking, uh, you know, about the future and about what was going to uh, work and wasn't going to work. And he realized if we don't make some sort of concession, this is going to get worse. Uh, and, you know, the monarchy might get overthrown. We're going to have to make some sort of a major concession, some sort of major compromise to sort of, you know, uh, try to calm the waters out here. Uh, uh, and you know, so this thing doesn't get out of control. Uh, and so the Tsar uh, had uh, a legislative body created, like a Congress, like a parliament, uh, with elected representatives, uh, you know, with the voting public, uh, uh, getting to vote politicians into office. Uh, so it was a major step, uh, since Russia was way behind Europe uh, in, in this sense, politically as well as otherwise, as we know. Uh, but uh, a lot of the European countries had gone through this step, you know, acquiring a... Uh, a legislature elected, uh, you know, a body at least one uh, decade, sometimes centuries before this. Uh, so uh, Russia's late to the party, uh, but uh, it's an it's an important step. Uh, though the power of the Duma or the new legislature, uh, it became clear pretty quickly was limited. It's still better than not having it at all from a democratic perspective, from the perspective of the needs and desires of the people. Uh, but uh, uh, it wasn't quite what it looked uh, on the surface, and that was by design.